Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. Thursday, 22nd of April. And going to start off then with the close on Wall Street, where we finished up across the major three indices around 0.9%. So snapping that two-day losing streak. And this morning, then going into the European Open, just gone through 7 a.m. now as I'm recording this. The DAX future is just printing session highs up 87. NASDAQ as well, just having a, a test on the overnight uh, kind of late US close, Asia Pacific high region uh, in the NASDAQ to keep an eye on here in the futures. Uh, as, as markets continue to settle after that nervous start to the week, so kind of like what we were suggesting in the briefing this time yesterday, that just a little bit of uh, calmness coming into what was, uh, I thought, a little bit overplayed in terms of negativity for the sell-off given the context of just how high that we were in the equity markets and this idea i guess of you know having had this pretty strong run up in the last couple of weeks for us equities pricing in almost perfection if you like and then what's happened here is the global covid situation generally has got worse in terms of number of cases on a global level it's just that a lot of that is uh, very focused on the emerging uh, developing country kind of area and so India particularly in the spotlight Japan we have seen though in developed world country also getting worse uh, but generally areas of course of, of greater magnitude for financial markets like the US uh, and, and say the UK to a certain extent have been more relatively controlled but the COVID thing certainly just uh, has been a focal point. But uh, again, I don't think it comes as a, as a great surprise. Those trends have been emerging for some time. So yesterday really just putting in a bit of a, a recovery. Um, overall, actually the, the small cap Russell 2000 outperformed about two to one against the three usual kind of major US indices like the S&P, the Dow and NASDAQ 100. <coughs> Overnight in the Asia pack session then, Similar kind of story, uh, taking the positive handover from, from the Americans. Uh, Japan outperformed Hong Kong, Australia, uh, just eking out modest gains. India, a laggard. Um, 314,835 new cases in India for COVID-19 in one 24-hour period is a record. Uh, and subsequently, their, their equity market continues to be um, weighed by that ongoing worsening situation for the time being. A lot to be said as well, actually, on that point uh, about this kind of two-speed recovery between the likes of the US and then these emerging market countries and, uh, and, and the real kind of necessity globally, if you want to see the full... Uh, strength of recovery in the second half of this year because of the, the demand that comes from these large populous areas that are emerging markets uh, and <coughs> although for the moment the market seem to be managing the fallout um, of the COVID situation because of the um, nature of where the issue is arising at the moment one thing is, um, it does impede a little bit the recovery narrative to the most extreme extent, uh, given the nature of the fact that, that you know, the demand's going to be uh, kind of suppressed on that, that two-speed recovery, as I mentioned. The one thing I actually think for equities, and you know, I was talking to, to Sam, one of the traders here yesterday, was that you know, perhaps this is what equities really need, um, which is there was a lot of apprehension, of course, over recent months about... Uh, the kind of the more uh, solid outlook that we were, we were really factoring in for markets going forward and ultimately that does tend to then lead to the discussion about tapering and so on we've had that now emerge from the Bank of Canada yesterday being the first major bank to take that step but perhaps the the kind of risk then on the global level of COVID is enough to keep central banks kind of true to their word of just holding the line for the moment and I know Canada have taken that that kind of first step I, I, I do find it hard to see the lights of the Fed and the ECB following to be quite honest uh, and does that provide those more optimal conditions then where it kind of <coughs> you've got you've got a, a more constructive narrative growth story going forward but still supportive uh, monetary policy environment coupled with as I'm going to talk about um, still a lot of stimulus coming from the fiscal side 
uh, as I'll discuss in Italy and Mario Draghi's latest plans as well to inject over 200 billion uh, in a recovery package for a ra radical restructuring, restructuring of it the Italian economy. Um, so something to just think about on a balance uh, going forward because you know overall I still think that we go higher here in equities generally um, going forward. Um, yields as well continue to remain uh, generally lower. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're up around five and a half ticks going into the mo um, this morning, and that coming in step with generally modest gains seen in in the equity market at the moment. Um, gold um, found finding a bit of uh, a test here around a, a, an interesting technical level. So actually worth keeping an eye on because we've just had a slight slip below it uh, that was holding during the late Asia Pac hours uh, and early during um, well the, the kind of early. Uh, or late European afternoon going to early part of the, the back end of the US session. Uh, and that pivot on the daily uh, technicals as well as the high on the 19th uh, was holding up and it's just seen it being pressured here uh, more recently. So uh, we're keeping an eye then for the next level of, of, of interest down at 1788 spot seven in the, in the futures market. Uh, this coming of course after quite a nice uptrend over the last two days we've had in gold uh, having added you know a good 30 bucks to price uh, probably having found a target near that 1800 bit of profit taking coming in given the degree of run-up that that price has had fx market's pretty quiet as you can see here euro dollar left and, and cable pretty locked in in, in fairly sideways price action at the moment and of course we've got the ecb coming up later which we which is going to be the main topic to discuss right now um, so what are we to expect from the ECB today? Well, in summary, I'd say overall, it might well be a relatively tame event from a market reaction point of view. Um, here is the kind of general context of this meeting. The ECB is trapped in a situation which stubbornly high coronavirus infections are forcing tougher restrictions across the 19 nation region, dampening output and leaving the economy training well behind the US. At the same time, progress on vaccinations and joint fiscal aid is fueling optimism that a vigorous rebound is close. I guess, again, people may be a bit apprehensive given what Canada did yesterday because they themselves are facing quite a, a tricky COVID situation, which is leading to subsequent restrictions over large parts of the country. And irrespective of that, they chose to take that step to commence tapering. Um, I don't think that the ECB will follow. Um, so I, I think that uh, any apprehension is unwarranted and not needed at this point as far as the ECB is, is concerned. A um, few other things to be aware of then. What is the kind of timeline that we can be expecting from the ECB? Well, here's what the Bloomberg survey economists that was conducted earlier this month would suggest in terms of timings. So July, the ECB will reduce the pace of pandemic purchases. So still a long way to go here um, until, until we get that. And also as well, I think June generally for the likes of the ECB and the Federal Reserve is a really big meeting, at least at this point in time that we can see. Because by the time we get to several more weeks down the line, we're obviously going to have progressed in really two major places. The speed of vaccinations and also then what is the global COVID situation and domestic COVID situation and subsequent restrictions then uh, as a result of that going forward. Then we can have a little bit of, an, uh, of a more clearer update to when both those central banks will be issuing their latest projections. And at that point then we can see just, are we in a better place uh, generally if we've seen increased vaccinations, decreasing restrictions, do they need to then start talking about this reduction then of the amount of stimulus in the system and obviously the target being these um, emergency measures they uh, that the ECB have employed like the pandemic emergency purchase program. So July then it would be interesting. I don't think you need to wait for the June meeting to know that. Um, obviously tracking those aforementioned areas will be key to ascertaining the timing of these things as will obviously subsequent ECB speeches that will be coming over the coming weeks because there are already some of the more hawkish contingent of the ECB talking about this, this very thing already. Um, I don't think that that's the consensus of the governing council at this point. 
Beyond that, then, the fourth quarter, the ECB will give three months' notice on the pandemic program. Uh, first quarter, the ECB will end net purchases under the pandemic program. So again, to be clear, they already have an asset purchase program underlying their kind of um, normal QE um, proceedings. The PEP is on top of that. Um, and so, again, start reducing these purchases in July. Um, three months notice then issued in, in Q4 about then the subsequent ending of it as we go into the beginning of next year. Now, this is what what uh, economists are predicting. There's obviously a lot of uncertainties when we start looking this further forward, like the potential spread then that this situation does get worse in a lot of these emerging um, economies from a COVID perspective, and that that then has some tangible uh, kind of change to the virus. It mutates and therefore we start to see um, vaccines then when we're going into a point of requiring booster shots, which are then perhaps rendered ineffective to a certain degree against a new uh, variant. And so weather patterns would be very changing. The weather conditions we know generally, uh, COVID uh, tends to spread and be more transmissible in colder conditions. And so therefore, you know, this is the timeline we're tentatively looking at. It might not actually play out in this way. Uh, but this is what we need to go off and how markets are generally priced at this point. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives a bit more perspective. Again, the, the kind of crib sheet, of course, that ING put out. Um, I did share this with the, the Amplify Live community yesterday. I'll reshare it again later on today. But this is looking at the scenario analysis. Uh, and again, just to explain this graphic, so from left to right, you have the, the, the two major economic ways of which the governing council look at the economy to judge their decision-making process. So the outlook for inflation and growth, and then you've got the tools and instruments that they use, which is the interest rate, the QE program, and the PEP, and then any commentary on the exchange rate, which uh, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere near comments on the exchange rate at this point. So here then, the, the kind of base case, uh, and I must say I, I agree with ING here, that the, the language, which is always, if you're new to trading, it's the language and how they describe these areas and these tools that is indicative then of any potential uh, movement that could be seen in the likes of the Euro, European equities, European yields, and so on. And so it's the nuances that they're, they're hinting towards that go from up, more dovish inclination from what they're saying to below more hawkish the base case though the most likely outcome and i think it probably will happen today by by a fairly high conviction rate will be for growth somewhat higher inflate or for inflation somewhat higher inflation this year on the back of one-off factors so the kind of year of base effects from how we were going through this dramatic drop in demand this time last year, the energy price rises and so on and so forth. So inflation is going to go up, but they see it as a temporary pop before then uh, kind of normalizing. For the growth outlook, recent data confirmed the base case of a gradual recovery. <coughs> so an upgrade of this, if they were going to be more hawkish, would be a, a, a tilt more towards the second half of them commenting would be stronger than they're currently anticipating. I don't think that they can be in a position to really use that type of language at a point when vaccinations are picking up, which is positive in Europe, um, and COVID generally has been um, decelerating from what had been a, a worse situation just a few weeks ago, but restrictions are still in place. Things are still fairly uncertain. I don't think they've got the, the confidence yet to make that, that leap of faith uh, about talking that, that convincingly about the future. On the actual tools, no change. The PEP size to increase if necessary. So re reiterating that same language that they've said before. The alternatives here would be on a dovish side. So if dovish then would weaken the euro, probably boost European equities um, and see bond prices rise would be if they said no change, but intention to increase the PEP um, size communicated. Going more dovish, the ECB increasing the PEP envelope to keep higher pace of purchase in the second half of 2021. Again, for the balanced reasoning of what's just happening from what I've described, I don't think that they will go down a very dovish option. I think that's very low probability. On the flip side, being hawkish, the governing council assessment of declining future need to ease policy further. Uh, and again, 
I think that's just too. Uh, that's just we're not at that point yet for them to have that kind of confidence to be that sure. So overall, I think it's pretty bedded in this base case. Be aware of the alternatives uh, and strategically plan then for the likely market reaction um, that might come of that. But I would say be mindful of the fact that you're probably going to get this. Uh, and given the fact that I don't think I'm unique in having this view or ING having this view, I think it's pretty much shared across how the market is positioned and priced for today. And hence the reason why, um, unless we get a real shock and surprise, it might be that the due, that this meeting uh, is a bit of a bridge and the ECB and Lagarde will be looking to try and get through this meeting without making any communication blunders. Now, I know Lagarde gets criticized quite a lot for her communication techniques, but I think she'll try and keep it relatively on point, relatively concise and short and sharp. At least that's the advice I'd try and give her. Answer the questions in as quick and short a time as possible and get off the stage um, because you don't want to make a mistake. And, and this meeting should be just a bridge then to more important meetings when we get to June and the Eurozone should have seen a much larger degree of reopening and at that point the ECB can make a better judgment on the best subsequent course of action for monetary policy. All right, very brief update then. I did mention um, Mario Draghi, the former ECB president, and I talked about fiscal. So next week, according to the FT last night, was reporting that um, he's going to unveil a 221 billion euro recovery package to restructure the Italian economy. It's called the, the Draghi Recovery Plan, uh, which should be approved by the Italian cabinet by the end of this week. It involves 30 billion euros of Italian budgetary resources and 191.5 billion of loans and grants from something called the Next Generation EU Scheme, according to people familiar with the matter. Um, the Next Generation EU project requires member states to submit their plans by a target date of the end of April, hence the reason why this is materialized right now. And where this money is coming from, this kind of penciled 191.5 billion, um, this next generation EU scheme is where much of this money that Draghi's trying to get is coming from, is from that recovery fund of the 750 billion uh, that we've had agreed, obviously, over the course of the last year or so uh, from Europe. Um, so he's really, you know, putting in the request at this point but it's these sorts of things this fiscal commitment and perhaps then the covid the global situation which keeps then uh, central bankers a little bit apprehensive x i'm going to say for now canada um then i i think that's a supportive environment for keeping um any of that um, runaway yield on a on the tightening of financial conditions debate on ice and means that the, the the market can kind of simmer away in a generally calm upward fashion that it has done when it comes to the equity market uh, over the medium term. Uh, the other thing was just on vaccines. So just a quick mention, J&J &J published their single shot COVID-19 vaccine phase three data, came out uh, fairly late last night. They stated it remains confident in the positive benefit risk profile of the vaccine with 85% effective against severe and critical disease as well as meeting its primary endpoints. Separately, we also have this, which was the Serum Institute of India. They'll be able to raise its monthly output of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine to 100 million doses by July from 60 to 70 million at the moment. However, that is later than the previous timeline that they had said before of the end of May, according to their chief executive. Okay, quick look at the calendar of what's coming out today. And so the European morning is very quiet, nothing major coming out. So really you have to wait for the, the first part of the ECB, which is a statement, which is going to be at 12.45. Yeah, probably, if anything, that's the, the more, more dull part of what otherwise this is going to be an overall very quiet meeting uh, that's expected. Um, and then the press conference will follow at 1.30 as usual, and that's where there could be a little bit more interest, where she's got a little bit more flexibility to, to talk and obviously counteracting uh, the general questions in the Q&A format. 
You've got the weekly jobless numbers coming out of the US. Could be interesting. Um, we had a 576,000 print last week. That was substantially below market expectations of 700,000. Um, in fact, um, it was the lowest level since the negative effects of the coronavirus have really been felt since March 2020. So the question mark is, you know, can that be uh, a consistent pattern or not? The consensus estimate is for a bounce back up to around 617,000. However, that in itself is still actually relatively low comparative to the recent weeks over the last couple of months for, for jobless claims. You've also got existing home sales, um, not expecting a great deal of change there from previous, that's coming out at three. Eurozone consumer confidence flash running for April at three as well. In terms of these data points as a cluster, uh, I don't really see too much in the way of any associated risks or um, potential catalysts to shift sentiment on the intraday perspective from, from any of these, to be quite honest. Um, it really does depend on where we're at technically on some of these charts. If we're at quite a key technical point, perhaps an outlier is enough to bump us either way, but I don't think there are any game changes on, on any of these three measures. Supply-wise, uh, if you are looking at fixed income, there's a, there's a hefty amount coming on the market from um, Spain and France this morning. And then from a US earnings perspective, yeah, kind of a three to look out for, AT&T, Intel, uh, and some US airliners, American airlines as well coming out. Uh, later on today that is it i'm going to leave you to it and let you get on with the session um, you can reach me in the the amplify live community if you have any questions at all i'll be in there throughout the day and i'll be covering the ecb live of course with the team uh, otherwise if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe any questions just drop a comment happy to help all right have a good day guys good luck for the ecb